I uh, have been a member of the Ruby community for a long time. I have to give like a little bit of personal backstory because otherwise this whole talk doesn't really make sense. Um, but I've been a uh, Rubyist now for eight years. I graduated from a code school in 2012 called Hungry Academy. It was a, a, a full-time school for six months and it was in DC and they paid us to go. And that doesn't exist today uh, with you know, any luck that will exist before I die. I want to rebuild that thing to pay people to learn to code because the money is there and there's a model that works and it does not involve garnishing people's wages as it does today. I don't know how familiar you are with the boot camp industry as a whole, but today a lot of people end up getting in a real awful situation coming into software and that's not how I want to welcome people to the world. Um, but I, I came into it because Living Social just said, hey, here's an engineering salary to learn to program. Uh, they hired me when I was a poker dealer. You know, who knew a little HTML? And that was eight years ago, and I've had a long and uh, successful career. And if I add it all up, I've made, uh, you know, over a million dollars uh, because of this language. You know, my kids ate it all. My children are ridiculous. They will not stop eating muffins. We go to Costco and we buy those big boxes of muffins. It's like a day. Like two children can eat 12 muffins a day? Really? What even is that? So is this the big screen that I'm trying to airplay through? Okay. Uh, so I went to this boot camp thing and that went okay. And then I got a job at Living Social and then I got a job at New Relic and then I got a job at Heroku and very recently I got a job at Timescale. So I am obligated by the nature of my work to now talk to you about this company Timescale who bought us our beer tonight and I went to the local New Seasons and bought only Portland brewed beers for you all at a markup, at a New Seasons markup, which I think is also a Portland business, aren't they? Isn't New Seasons at least only Northwest, I think. Um, maybe not, I hope I didn't make that up. They just sold to Korea. Is Planet Argon Korean owned, out of curiosity? I like my Korean friends, but I do not like uh, to sell things to Korea that are Portland made, that's kind of what I did there. But that's, that's good news for them probably. Probably some people who had a good dream got real rich off of that. So this company, Timescale, I'm uh, hoping to help the founders get real rich because it's a brilliant dream. They built a time series database that is in fact Postgres. It's an open source uh, extension for Postgres. Uh, for those of you who have worked with time series data, again, like things that we're recording over time, right? Which is, as it turns out, just about everything with a timestamp. Uh, but specifically the kinds of things where you care about the timestamp. So think of you like recording metrics from your server or your application, how long it took to load a page, right? And you get a little timestamp and you can track those things over time. So normally you would have to use a purpose-built time series database to do that kind of work. Like most Rubyists I think today are on board with the Postgres train. We all love Postgres. Nobody, I hope, is still trapped in the MySQL world, right? Uh, but we, uh, when we go to build something that's gonna to need to write real quickly, we often have to look to a NoSQL solution. And I am not a huge fan of NoSQL for reasons that I will not <laughs> elucidate for you here. Uh, I will go into it at length any other time. I've talked to you about NoSQL versus SQL, but um, SQL is the one true way, in my humble opinion. Uh, I think that we should stick to that whole structured data thing. When we built a big pool for storing structured data, we should not remove the structured controls from said data pool. And Timescale is an opportunity to do that with time series data. Uh, it writes very, very quickly. It reads very, very quickly. It was built by some brilliant computer scientists at Princeton, uh, out of the Princeton Research Lab. And they all work there and they started this company. So if you have a reason to store metrics uh, or logs or anything like that, give Timescale a Google when you are searching for the solution there. It's a fantastic choice. Uh, so that's the, the end of my spiel on Timescale. Thank you for the beer, Timescale. I want to talk to you about Ruby now. So as I said earlier, I got into Ruby through a bootcamp. And that bootcamp at Living Social at the time was run by a man named Chad Fowler, uh, who wrote a famous uh, Ruby book and was involved in the, the founding and the, the creation of the very first Ruby conference uh, back in the day in Florida that led to the creation of Ruby Central. Uh, Ruby Central being one of the primary foundations that has supported the growth of Ruby over the years. So Ruby Central organized Ruby comps Going forward, at some point they started organizing Rails comps as well. At some point they partnered with O'Reilly to help organizing both of those and then they broke up in 2011, thankfully, because O'Reilly, I love you, but man, you're charging people a lot of money for my content. They charge, I think for OzCon, if you go and speak at OzCon, they'll give you a ticket to get in, but then they will resell the videos of your talk, content which they then own, 
back to the attendees for $3,000. It's like a $3,000 ticket to go to OzCon and then $3,000 extra if you want to watch the videos of the talks you just paid to go see. It's pretty impressive capitalism. Um, so uh, this, this Ruby thing, I got distracted, sorry. Um, I got into Ruby because of Chad Fowler and Chad Fowler ran the team at Living Social and when I was there, he had hired all of the best Rubyists that he knew. And he, he and this guy, Jeff Kazmier, had this idea that they were gonna make some more. They were like, well, let's just mint some new Rubyists from scratch. So I had a huge opportunity coming into this industry to have some really strong mentors. Like I really didn't learn uh, the wrong way to do anything. I was just kind of guided down the happy path, which we all know in, in Ruby and Rails is kind of the way to go, right? If you get off of the tracks in Rails, things get pretty bad, right? And then Planet Argon is gonna take over the contract very shortly afterwards and, and get you back on the tracks. Um, it's an uncomfortable world, but I was guided into this industry. So my point in saying all of this is that I owe a huge debt to these people because I came out of a, a, a world where I was working as a poker dealer. I just had my second child, right? And I was laid off at this casino. And then my insurance expired literally like a week before my son was born, right? At the time we had OHP, the Oregon Health Plan, covered my $45,000 bill for my son to be born. But that, that's not a reality for people anymore. Now you can just get health insurance anywhere. You don't have to work for a big corporation. This is why I was a car salesman when my first child was born. Uh, I owe a huge debt to these people for paying me to learn to code and for guiding me towards a path that allowed me to have an incredibly sexual, successful career. So I'm, I'm trying to pay it forward now at this point in my life, right? And that's part of why I have offered to step up and organize this meetup. Uh, Wilfred came to me I was getting more involved with PDXRB because I was super lonely as a Rubyist, like working from home and also traveling the world as a developer advocate. You know, I, I have a lot of friends at all of these conferences you, for up to five minutes at a time. I have these friends, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's really a great life. Um, but then I come home and, I, and the, the nice thing is then I stay in my closet. So my office at home is literally like you leave my bedroom and you go into the master bath and then in the closet, at the back of the closet, there's a little hobbit door like this tall in the back where someone has finished the crawl space and you open it up and there's a whole office in there. That's where I live. I live in the hobbit hole at the back of my office. Sometimes I don't go outside for a week at a time and I realize like, maybe you should just go to the grocery store and just buy something for no reason because you should really like leave the house. So these meetups are an opportunity for me to come and like socialize with human beings and confirm that I can still do it um, in the times when I'm not traveling. So I want uh, to help rebuild the dream that PDXRB was for me. When I first came here, we had this uh, anarchist ghost pirate ship uh, steering in a direction where it was growing and growing and growing. And I don't think that things necessarily have been terrible lately. I think that we were rehomed. Um, I think that like moving locations is complicated and I aim to fix that soon. Uh, I'd like to talk with you after this, uh, Robbie, if you have a moment. But um, being a, a nomadic meetup is sometimes damaging. Not having a specific place and time where you exist every month is sometimes harder to find people. Uh, I think there are a lot of things like that that are no one's fault. I, I applaud everyone who's been involved with PDXRB and the growth of, of PDXRB. We're, we're a 100-person meetup. We're a 200-person meetup. We should be leading tech in this community, uh, and we will. And we're going to get there, but I'm going to ask you all for your help about how to do that. So um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Ruby Association and what that is. Has anyone ever heard of the Ruby Association? No? Okay. Uh, the Ruby Association is the, the association that is in Japan that funds the development of Ruby, open source development of Ruby. They uh, provide things like the... Um, the Ruby Prize, Has anyone heard of the Ruby Prize? It's a prize of about $10,000 uh, to a, an extraordinary Ruby project, an extraordinary open source Ruby project. The winner this year uh, is a gentleman named Diana who worked on the new uh, iteration of IRB that was released with 2.7. So all of the cool features that you get with new IRB where you have like multi-line editing and you can go up and back and all of that, uh, that's all Diana's work and Diana won the Ruby Prize for that. Uh, and if you find any bugs, uh, you should Go ahead and yell at Yana about them. He'll get right on them as soon as he can. But the Ruby Association does things like award the Ruby Prize and to support developers like Yana working in Japan, who in fact make significantly less than they do in the United States. So for reference sake, I think like a mid to senior level developer in the Tokyo area makes maybe 70 or $80,000 a year. 
and their salary probably will not in their lifetime exceed $100,000 a year unless they go private, like consulting, right? So um, I'm pretty sure that many juniors their second year out make more than 100K in the United States. And I think senior salaries in the Portland area probably cap out around 150, but down in the Bay Area, we're talking 350, 380, you know, for just a, a, a senior uh, developer, just a, I don't mean to <laughs> belittle that work, my goodness, the people, you know, who build and carry the business, uh, like that, that senior developer role, $380,000 a year, you know, so we're kind of killing it on the Japanese Ruby community. Uh, the Ruby Association is doing what they can to raise funds for people locally from local companies in Japan. But the fact of the matter is that like corporations in Japan are pretty slow to adopt new technologies. And Ruby for Japan, by Japan standards, is still a fairly new technology. Um, I mean, they're, they're running it in a lot of uh, interesting ways. It's in a lot of vending machines in Japan. A lot of uh, MRuby implementations. Have you ever, all ever used MRuby? I'm definitely gonna give a talk about MRuby then. I have a cool MRuby talk to give, um, but MRuby is embedded Ruby. And uh, it's a brilliant project about running uh, Ruby on like hardware limited devices, like inside of a vending machine. I actually have an MRuby watch uh, that was gifted uh, to me at, a, at one of these conferences. The, the Japanese Ruby community could use some of that money that we all make. Like I would guess that I had said, I've been in this for eight years and I made a million bucks. I would guess that like together in this room, we probably made $20 million on the backs of some people in Japan who haven't made a quarter of that over the same time period, right? That's kind of sad to me, right? Because these people work really hard to build the language. Like the, the coming up to the release around Christmas, Yana was like pulling all nighters until he like passed out on his laptop and then would like wake up and code some more and like pass out, you know? And I would just like keep feeding him uh, Blue Star Donuts and being like, keep coding. We must release IRB, right? Yeah. But the, the Japanese Ruby team, um, for a lot of reasons, I think, again, not that it's anyone's fault, they don't see a lot of the money that we see. I've attended some, some parties at some Ruby conferences in America that are just absurd. Like, really, you hired Metallica for 40 people? Like, is that necessary? I feel like, you know, <laughs> you have, like... We have a lot of, the money is raining out on us. It's the Silicon Valley money. The venture capitalists wanted to put this money out there. Ruby Association is an opportunity for us to do it. But it's difficult to give money to an open source foundation like that. So there's a lot of tax complications here that I don't want to go into too deeply, but 501c3 status is very important to an American corporation because at the end of the year, every company is like, whoa, we made too much money, whoopsies. We don't want to actually pay taxes on all that money we made. So what can we do to reduce our tax burden this year? They do a lot of fancy footwork. One of the things that they do is they go and look for 501c3 organizations to donate money to. So Ruby Together is an organization that I'm a part of. I'm on the board of Ruby Together. Ruby Together is a trade organization. It's a 501c6, which is an important distinction here because it's not um, different from a tax perspective, but from a company's perspective, someone who is not an accountant, they're a developer who started a consultancy, for example, those are different things. They're like, oh, number doesn't match. I was told by my accountant to find a 501c3 and not a 501c6. And that complicates things for us in raising money. So the Ruby Together Foundation, we raise about a quarter million dollars a year um, from individual contributors primarily. We have individual memberships for developers who are committed to Ruby uh, between like five and $15. Some people give us $50 a month or whatever it is, but I think like a base membership is like $5 for the raise. They pay a monthly subscription basically for the development of Ruby. And we use that money to do things like hire early career underrepresented developers to pair program with open source developers, with senior open source devs. We'll pay each half of that pair $75 an hour, and we will pair them up for eight hours a month to work on open source. And our plan in doing work like that is that we are seeding the next generation of open source developers. Because Ruby at this point is a pretty mature community, right? Like I don't see a whole lot of new gems coming out all the time. Right? And that's kind of a good thing, actually. If you, you're seeing multiple releases of Twitter API gems uh, every month, that's probably a bad sign for your community. Right? If you try and work with the Twitter API in Ruby, you use a gem called Twitter. Right? So a couple months ago, a month ago, uh, that gem was forked, by the way. 
SF Eric, the man who maintained that gem, has uh, turned it into abandoned ware. I would recommend you look at Twitter 2 now, which is the fork that the people banging on the door in the issues thing for about a year created uh, to work with the Twitter API, which is kind of sucky now anyway. Thanks, Twitter, for wrecking everything beautiful. Twitter was like my go-to API to teach people Ruby because it was so much fun. Like the time from zero to joy was like five minutes. So like, here's how we're going to write some Ruby. And you know, someone who's written a little code before, you could get them using the Ruby gem, Twitter, the Twitter gem, and you could have them send a tweet to themselves or like send a tweet that said, hello world in like five minutes. And now Twitter's like, if you would like to uh, use our API at all, please speak to our enterprise sales team so we can immediately latch these thumb screws onto you and start twisting. Uh, Ruby Together is a good organization. They give back a lot of money, but they don't do a very good job of getting money because they're a C6. Ruby Central, that company that Charred Char Fowler put together, right? They're a C6, but they are primarily an organization that runs conferences. That's what Ruby Central does. Ruby Central organizes RubyConf, they organize RailsConf, that's their whole job. And that's their charter, that's what they started doing. They've been doing it for many years. And I think that they should continue doing that. Um, but uh, Ruby Central at many times has been in a situation where people have proposed to them, hey, how about we do this other kind of work? Like where we pay people to get into open source, or we pay to run meetups, or we pay to run Rails bridges, or whatever it is, right? And um, for a lot of reasons, that hasn't come to pass, right? And it's complicated, but we have now these three Ruby organizations, right? We have Ruby Association, uh, we have Ruby Together, and we have Ruby Central. And Ruby Together is about promoting open source development of Ruby, right? Um, then we have the Node.js Foundation. Is anyone in JavaScript community here at all? Anyone heard of the Node.js Foundation? Uh, and then you've probably also heard of the JS Foundation. They also had this like bifurcated foundation thing. They had two distinct organizations. So this green logo here got a lot of flack about a lot of drama, and I'm not even close to educated enough to talk about what, what goes down in the JavaScript community because that changes on the daily. But uh, I understand what you did was it was like version two and then version 11 and then seven and then 18 and then there was a versioning change thing that happened uh, and I'm not throwing shade. Ruby does not get to throw shade about drama. There used to be a website called rubydrama.com. Thankfully we shut that down because we are not a community about drama anymore. We're over it, I think and I hope, right? Um, but the Node Foundation and the JS Foundation, they recently united to form the OpenJS Foundation, which is only here to say that this problem that we have, where we have three Ruby foundations, was solved first by the JavaScript community. When does JavaScript beat us, Ruby? When does JavaScript beat us to solving community drama? Unacceptable behavior. So my proposal uh, moving forward is that we become something more like the Python Software Foundation. I'm working with the people that I work with at Ruby together, people at the Ruby Association and the people at Ruby Central to try and form a unified organization called the Ruby Software Foundation. Because the Python Software Foundation was founded in Beaverton, where I live now in my closet, uh, I think it appropriate that we found the Ruby Software Foundation here. And that we unite under a common banner. Because we often have problems where you have a company like Google come along with a check for a million dollars that says Ruby on it. And they ask these various foundations, like where should this money land? So we know it goes to the development of Ruby. Like we're trying to contribute back to the language. Ruby's important to us, we wanna grow Ruby. Where does this money go? And everybody's doing this, right? Because we all have these specific and unique charters. Um, the JS Foundation, the, the previous uh, half of OpenJS Foundation was actually founded out of Linux Foundation. It was a, like an umbrella organization that helps you have that 501c3 status that the United States no longer grants really to software organizations. It's very difficult to achieve C3 status. Stumptown Syndicate is a C3 uh, here locally. And they have tried, I think, in the past to set up a similar umbrella status kind of thing. But Linux Foundation exists because they can create these open source orgs and then they take 30% off the top, which honestly is fine with me for the support services that Linux Foundation is able to offer because I go and um, see like the Prometheus project and all of these um, like Linux monitoring tools like the Kubernetes ecosystem is all under Linux Foundation um, work and they have great booths and they have great marketing presence and they're at all of the right conferences. The, the support is there, it's worth it to me. So I think the Ruby Software Foundation will probably get funded that way. Uh, but the reality of this thing is this is not a thing I can build myself. There's no way, it's like impossible. This won't happen if I have to build it all myself. So I want you to help me. And the first step is to get people here to this meeting. I want people to start coming in because the Python Software Foundation raised $3 million last year. And 
all of the Ruby organizations together didn't raise a third of that. And that's not often for us as a language. And we hear people talk about things like Ruby is dying and we're gonna game that metric real hard. The Ruby is dying thing is a trope, right? It's, it's ridiculous, it's not real. This is, this is a thing that people have been saying for years and years, as long as I've been in Ruby. There's a bunch of people on Orange website that shall not be named um, who dislike the world generally and specifically Rubyists because we keep smiling while we type and that's inappropriate behavior for programmers. But the, the reality is that we can achieve that. We can get that, that level of income. The companies are, I mean, what has Ruby made it with the United States as a percentage like over the last decade? Billions of dollars. I have no doubt that number starts with a B, right? Billions of dollars. And how much of it ended up back in Japan? Ten, tens of dollars, as much as tens of dollars, right? And not just Japan, but, but organizations like this, right? I know so many Ruby, Ruby meetups that are walking around begging for pizza right now, it's ridiculous. It's like, why is that a reality for us? There should just be some open source foundation that we all throw five bucks a month into, and all of the meetups that ever want to exist, and all the Rails Girls wig shops, and all the Rails Bridge, they all just have all the money they ever need. Because $5 a month from every Ruby developer in the company just funds everything forever. That's all it takes, right? I'm not suggesting that we make that Ruby together just because I'm working there and that seems like a conflict of interest to me being on the board. I'm suggesting we build a new thing and I want your help to do that thing. Um, so the first goal for me is to grow this meetup. The next time that you come, I want you to bring a friend, like literally drag a person from your place of work who also writes Ruby. Encourage some other .NET developer that you know to check out this Ruby thing because this Ruby stuff is hot and it's taking off, right? The metric that people are using on, on uh, Orange website, by the way, that they're describing is actually a decline in the number of repos created on GitHub, right? And that's not an accurate way to measure the success of a, a language community, as it turns out, because Ruby doesn't make as many repos as JavaScript does. JavaScript's gonna outpace us a thousand to one for the next decade making repos on GitHub because they're rewriting everything over and over and over again. Try and use the Twitter API in JavaScript. I found eight packages the last time I looked, and those were just the popular ones. And every one of them covered some subset of the API with a different methodology and a different approach. And Ruby being an opinionated community, we were able to unite the time behind one. It's now Twitter 2, okay? But, but the dream is there. I think that this metric that people use where they show this decline in repos can be gamed, however. And in 2020, at the end of this year, we're gonna have a very big release for Ruby. We're gonna take the, the ground out from under a lot of people who've been critical of our language for a long time. And that Ruby is going to be released next Christmas in 3.0 and it's going to be three times faster. I'm 100% confident that that's gonna happen as compared to Ruby 2.0. By Christmas next year, we're gonna release 3.0. And I've been working in marketing for a while now as a developer advocate and I understand press cycles. And I understand that's gonna generate a lot of press for us on the internet as a language. We're gonna be all over Orange website. And I think it would be great if the first person to go and find their favorite graph showing the decline in repos actually saw like a spike like this on that graph and was like, oh wait, maybe I'm not allowed to dog on Ruby anymore. And the way we build that spike for repo creation is we go to the boot camps because the boot camps are driving the creation of JavaScript repos right now. The boot camps across the country, like primarily JavaScript, probably 70%, I would say, are writing JavaScript all the time. And I, know a lot of those people, because I'm a bootcamp baby. And I can go to those bootcamps and I can pitch them on a two week Ruby curriculum. I can say, look, hey, I've got this open Ruby curriculum. It's free, we open sourced it under whatever license we choose as PDXRB. We just choose a license, I don't care. And we put this thing out there and it's an open curriculum for how to learn Ruby. And I've written this thing, it's up on GitHub. I'm not ready to share it with you all yet because there's nothing there. It says like, first step, hello world. The second step literally says like the rest of the owl and it has an owl emoji. Um, <laughs> But I'm gonna put a little more framework in there so we as a collective can start working on this in February, next month. Our next meetup is gonna be in February at Microsoft. Scott Hanselman is speaking. The goal is to get 60 people, which is our cap, at that meetup. So you help me tell every Rubyist you know that PDXRB is happening again and that we've got Scott Hanselman coming, who's just a Twitter famous person, right? Scott is actually a great speaker. Uh, we had him come speak at PDXRB back in the day. And if, if we get him back again, hopefully we'll draw some of those people out of the woodwork, people who like to hide in their hobbit hole at the back of the closet instead of coming down and actually socializing, right? Uh, and we'll get this group up to 60. And in front of 60 people, I will make a pitch 
that we as Portland Ruby should develop an open Ruby curriculum that we open source and that I on the road and all of you, when the opportunity presents itself, can pitch to boot camps. It's a two week course. You add two weeks onto the existing JavaScript curriculum you have and then your brand new developers have experience in a back end language and you're not just dropping them off to flail about in the ocean that is software, right? They've written JavaScript and yes, JavaScript is also a back end language, but if you uh, can go into a shop with JavaScript and Ruby on your resume, you're gonna be far better off than every single one of your peers. So you have a competitive advantage by adding this two week free open source curriculum to your program. I can pitch that and bootcamp people make a lot of repos. They make a lot of repos over and over again. I made so many repos, man. I have 170 repos. I know that because when I joined my company, I filled out a prior invention form at Timescale. And the CTO wrote to me, was like, so I shouldn't be surprised, but just give me a hint, which of the 168 repos that you've created might be relevant to our business? Because I just marked on my prior inventions, everything on my GitHub. <laughs> And then I was like, okay, fine, I'll just take it off. I don't care. You can, they can have all my code because it's mostly bad Rails apps, including my first Rails app. So we do that and we spike the metric. And when Ruby drops at the end of the year, game over for people who want to be critical. We're going to be faster. We're going to be more popular on any graph they can make up. Okay? There's no way I can achieve that alone. I'm a much too busy a human being and I have an infant and she takes more time than she deserves. She mostly just screams at me because she's bored. So uh, I could really use some help. And first step is make a friend come. And you don't even have to be the person who's motivated or has the energy in their life to do this thing right now. Just find some people who look young and hopeful, okay? <laughs> find, find the little bright-eyed uh, new Rubyists who wanna make a mark and get something on their resume that says, hey, I contributed to the, uh, the Open Ruby curriculum back before it was really a thing. And next month in February, We'll talk about where we're gonna do that and we're gonna have like a Saturday hackathon at some space around town. I've got a couple of people who are gonna volunteer space. Uh, we're just all gonna sit down and write a Ruby curriculum all collectively. And 100 people can do that real fast. One person could maybe not do that in his lifetime. So we sit down and we create a two-week curriculum for how to learn Ruby, probably a beginner one and a mid-level one and a senior one. And then we're good. We have this resource out there and I will go and sell the thing for you. You help me build it. So uh, that's how we're gonna get $3,117,000 for Ruby. Thank you. I'm the Jonan Show on the internet. It has been a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you again for Planet uh, Argon for hosting. Thank you, Ruby.